So I did make some notes for this one just because uh, it, it was helping me just trying to get the get my hands around what this chapter was about because it was kind of like one of these like chapters that sort of was a bunch of recipes or different things. Mm -hmm. you know, and <laughs> yeah, actually, I um, I didn't even get to it till the, um, this morning and to, to read and to do all my stuff and I couldn't fully understand like all of the stuff that I mean like a lot of it was just like hand calculation there wasn't a lot of R code or anything yeah a lot of hand calculation I mean it's all pretty straightforward I guess if you, it's one of those things that's easy to calculate if you know what to calculate <laughs> mm -hmm. so and then you know knowing what to calculate is not always easy but I think in the final analysis of the chapter he gives this really nice approach using um uh fake data simulation which I just love you know I, mm -hmm. and um Hold on, yeah. Yeah. You want to go ahead and uh, get started? Anyway. Yep. Uh, I used to some fake data simulation today to answer a question. I, and I know it's probably a super simple question to answer. I'm like, ah, like I had some, I, asked, I had some like simple, I was doing some simple machine learning runs and I did like 10 runs of this thing. And I had some, um, you know, calculate the mean, the standard deviation of it, right? Pretty straightforward, mm -hmm. right? And I'm like, and somebody else produced the, the same thing, but they got a result that was like, seemed like, you know hard to believe so mm -hmm. rather than just like you know getting out the thing i wanted to know if his he had a smaller standard deviation which surprised me so rather than getting out looking up what is the you know chi square blah blah i just like did a simulation did a, you know yeah a million runs of drawing things and found out yeah things, right? yeah so why not <laughs> sure so all right book club regressions and other stories chapter 16 sure okay so then you should see my R studio now, right? Uh, yes. Hold on. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yes. Actually, I didn't want to show my R studio. I wanted to show. Here's a way to just switch top to bottom. Let's just do. Can you switch screen? Do you have to stop and redo it? Is that what you have to do? Do you know? What do you mean in terms of sharing screen? Yeah. I mean, yeah. You can you can just change which screen. You just change it, right? I found out how to do it. my lights okay so this is chapter 16 um let me dock this over here there we go. chapter 16 and this chapter is basically about design you know before you do the experiment and partially after you do the experiment understanding how you would design your experiment and what kind of sample size you should need uh he tests a little thing about statistical power where he was he wants to downplay a little bit with statistical power, but he still calculates statistical power for a lot of things. So I'm not sure, you know, <laughs> what I don't think he fully made his point there. I guess he was his point was you don't rely 100 percent on statistical power. Just because you don't have statistical power, mm -hmm. you know, on some particular thing doesn't mean you can't get something useful out of it. You just have to be careful what you say, right? That's basically mm -hmm. my very, very high level um summary. So what is statistical power? It's basically the probability that a particular comparison or a particular result will achieve statistical significance, however you want to def define that as well, right? So there's a couple, two parameters here, sort of there's the probability of success and then statistical significance. And you do an analysis by, well, you kind of hypothesize some kind of effect size. And he says, well, one way you could do that is just consider range of values, or maybe you, you should just base it on whatever magnitude of the effect should be there would be useful result, right? That's mm -hmm. one way to do it, right? If, you, if you're expecting your, uh, um, if you're like doing a disease, a drug treatment or something like that, you'd want to, you know, want to have some kind of significant, I mean, practically significant, not statistically significant, practically significant results. So you should use that perhaps as your, uh, you know, maybe half that or a tenth that or something as your hypothesized effect size to see what you need to detect that, right? Mm -hmm. And then you also make some assumptions about the variability of the data and then figure out what kind of sample size and then you can calculate from that or simulate from that what your um, uh, likely outcomes would be and then calculate the probability that finally you would be able to get a good p-value. Uh, he does mention here, and I think this is a really interesting section in the book about low power experiments it can be mm -hmm. tempting, right? Because they maybe don't cost, yes, if you have a particularly low power experiment that doesn't cost you much to do, you might be tempted to roll the dice, you know, <laughs> shake the dice and hope you get a significant result. But he says the problem with that is if you do get a significant result, you may have just got, you know, have made a type N error or worse, a type S error. And he calls that the winner's curse, which I think was an interesting idea because you can imagine like, oh, I'll just try this out. I mean, I don't, it's not really a high power study, but maybe there's a big effect and you see a big effect. 
well, wait a minute. I wouldn't, you know, it's just, just luck or bad luck, as it were. Right? <laughs> so I just this, is like, this is the entire field of psychology. For like it does life. seem like it, right? In okay. medicine, too, I feel there's like, so many, like there's so many things that we, is, so, and not just psychology, my other social sciences and medical yeah. sciences, but yeah, psychology, and this, I can speak for that one specifically, where, yeah, there's just so many small samples that just are significant. But yeah, there's actually a famous or infamous study in, um, social psychology about like ESP where right that's fair I do that famous uh you can pit professor yeah. um published all this evidence but then it turns out that he had done a bunch of other studies that right well. yeah so yeah. yeah I mean <laughs> like um yeah so, you know you keep going yeah you roll the dice what do you say you roll the dice enough times you know five percent is not that uncommon right five percent is like one out of twenty I got a twenty side die here if I roll this thing right I, I rolled plenty of twenties on this thing playing D D or whatever other games so, yeah <laughs> don't tell me it's such a you know unusual thing right mm -hmm. so anyway that's the the that idea um and so then he talks now this part of the book he talks about i think the next couple of sections is just some examples or how you would do this for particular cases right and these are all to me i thought were pretty straightforward except for this funky calculation here to figure out the um how many with the sample size to achieve a specified power you know yeah i just had to think about this a few times in order to understand why how he came up with this it's not it's actually pretty straightforward it just requires you know holding a few ideas in your head at the same time but uh, so, for example, we know that if you want to, what's the sample size you need to achieve a particular specified standard error? Well, mm -hmm. for a proportion uh, measurement, right? Mm -hmm. That's that we know is going to just be, you know, this, we know I can't think the standard error for that is P, Q, or N, square root of that. Um, or the worst case, uh, you know, and often, and often a good approximation as well is 0 0.5 over squared N, right? So uh, you can use that to then turn that around and compute what kind of sample size you need if you need to specify a certain standard error that you want to have, right? But more commonly, you want to achieve some power of statistical significance, and that's where this uh, calculation comes in, comes in from. Um, the idea being that if your results are going to, you want to make sure that the gray curve here is above um, uh, 1.96, 80% of the time, then, you know, you go through this, uh, thought process here that you have to be mm -hmm. you have to move that curve 2.8 standard deviations over in mm -hmm. order to achieve that 80 percent probability and it seems like oh how do you know how, for some reason it took me a little bit to understand but it's actually pretty straightforward right yeah can you remind me again so like the, the point at four like what is i, I forgot that's that. just the um you know the uh, how far on a normal curve you have to be to get 80 percent right Oh, right, right, oh, right, 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 yeah, yes. That's all that is. Right. Yes, yes, okay, yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you, sorry. I, I, it, it's confusing because- It is confusing, a lot of numbers. Two, there's like, they're, they're using different sides of the curve and which yeah. makes sense to me, yeah, okay, got it, yeah. Yeah, it definitely is confusing. Yeah, because I was using, I tried to do that 2.8 thing and then also, I guess if you want to use like a, a, a T distribution, it's um, 3. Right, he, he mentions that and, you know, he says he, he doesn't really, we mentioned briefly about the T distribution, but then he says, you know, if your sample size are that, he doesn't say this, but it kind of implied that if your sample size are that small, maybe you better uh, rethink your whole experiment. <laughs> well, well, yeah, actually, really well, in my example, uh, the, the, the study was like of these like classrooms, it was like 60 people or 34, uh, 68 classrooms. That's enough. Isn't it 68 30 is usually well, yeah. And so I was wondering, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess, yeah, it is 34 is, I guess it's not typically like under 25 per group that typically yeah. start worrying about T stuff, but anyway, yeah. So it is kind of um, you know, a thing. Uh, and then he does mention that you, when you do a comparison of proportions, like for example, for some kind of effect or something like that, you need about four times the samples. That makes sense because you now add, you're now taking the difference of two distribution so the standard deviation the variances are going to add so you're going to end up with right four mm -hmm. times needed okay so uh then the same kind of discussion he has about continuous distributions and there's the same idea you need one 2.8 standard deviations to get 80 percent power for 95 percent co confidence he does mention this idea about t distributions for small samples which does change that a little bit uh, and then for comparisons of means again you have to add the you know the variances Mm -hmm. of the two smaller groups, right? And then if the groups are equal and the standard deviations are about the same, then you can just use this approximation that the uh, you mm -hmm. know, you need two sigma over square root of n, right? Which means, again, you're going to need four times the size to get the same um, power. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, this is just an example that if the effect is like, expected to be like a half a standard deviation, then you're going to need um, 
you know, one half sigma over SE, we need that to be 2.8 to get 80% power. And you just go through the algebra and it's 126 uh, samples for that mm. particular example. But it's, that's, it's pretty straightforward, right? What you need to do. Yeah, I, I tried to do this and I, I messed up actually. I tried to use the mean difference between, um, I have a treatment and control situation, right. number 10. And so I was like putting the mean difference instead of 0.5. I didn't realize it had to be in units of standard deviation. So that was my bad. I actually screwed that up and ended up doing it a different way. But um, yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, let's see what else is there. Um, so in terms of regression predictors, he does make the point that, I mean, this is something, you know, um, if you add like more predictors, you can control for some more of the variance and you can decrease that residual standard deviation and reduce the required sample size. And there's an example of that that I'll do when we get to the end of this chapter uh, for the fake data thing. I don't know if you got as far as the fake data part, but I'm going to go through I that. I got into it, but I'm not. Yeah. not well, I'm going to kind of walk through a little bit with the tidyverse um, example of it, just so we can see how that works. Uh, and in general, as you know, uh, standard error scale is 1 over square root of n. That's just something you, you, know, you get used to uh, remembering. Uh, so if you ever, if you need to reduce the error on a coefficient, you're going to have to, you know, use that square root of n factor. So if you want to reduce it by half, you need four times the samples, and that's just the fact of life. And mm. then this sentence right here, I copied out of the book. I just thought it was really interesting. Um, yeah. And I think that's something you put on a t-shirt, you know, sample sizes are never large enough, right? It's, and it's, what he's, his point is, if you get more samples, you start to see more stuff in the data. You start to look at, maybe you look at interactions. Maybe you just, you know, yeah. maybe you look at some this other coefficients. This as a consultant, I can tell you this is such a huge thing because, of course, you know, clients are asking you, like, how much, what's, what's the sample size we need? And you go, well, okay, well, and then, of course, on the front end, you're like, well, if we're going to look at main effects, we're going to look at interactions, we're going to look at subgroups, we're going to do this. And, of course, they're all like, ah, oh, no, you, you know, it doesn't really matter. And then, of course, you, you so you power for, like, main effects, let's say. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, hey, let's get into, let's do a bunch of, um, you know. Now, all of a sudden, they want to do all the interactions. <laughs> like, we didn't get, yeah. Well, yeah. that's something he points out, too, and that's actually the next chart, but Next slide I'll just mention here though, is that one of the things, one of the things I think you've mentioned before is this idea is like, oh, we didn't see anything in the main effect. Let's look at some interactions. He says, that's actually a real bad idea because you might, you probably will find something in those interactions just by bad or good luck as it were, right? Yeah. So that seems like something to be very tempting to do, right? Well, yeah, I mean, and, and sometimes, I, I don't know, like, yeah, sometimes I can understand the, the, the purpose of like, you know, wanting to do exploratory stuff, but yeah, I think this was this is a great example of. I mean, like if you have a big if you have big enough data, you know, like one of the ways you can get around this is to do like you know a, a training and test kind of a right. to see if you know at least you know you get uh, similar results, I guess, for an interaction or something. And so in this next section, he talks about interactions, and he says, well, you know, if you want to get the same kind of power uh, for an interaction that has the same size as the main effect, which is not the common case. You need like four times the sample size just because it's an interaction. Uh, and he's so like he said, this implies a problem. If you don't find your anticipated main effect and then you go looking, hunting around the interactions to bail you to help to bail you out somehow, then you're likely going to be making some type M or even type S errors uh, just because of the winner's curse again on that, right? Right. So a lot of interactions to look at. You'd like to find something that's not real, you know, just noise. Uh, so and he says more commonly, he makes a point of you should arrange your coding when, you know, since you always have some flexibility in what's considered interaction, what's considered main effect, you want to arrange your coding so the expected main, of, the large, larger things are the main effects, right? The larger effects are the main effects. That's why they're called main effects. Mm -hmm. And his point though is further that then you even, you would expect, you wouldn't expect the interaction to be at the same scale. They're probably smaller. So if like half, you know, the half isn't that much smaller. Well, that's 16 times the number of samples. Um, so his point is, it's really hard to get, uh, you know, enough samples for the, these interactions. And you probably should just accept the fact that looking at the interactions, you're not going to have, you know, solid evidence of, of effects there. You're just going to have, you know, hints at things and, and uh, you know, you have to accept that uncertainty that's, that comes out of those interaction coefficients. Yeah. And they might maybe lead you to do some additional studies. You don't want to just draw conclusions immediately from, it. even if they're, and that's, I think the point he's trying to make here, and it's important. It's even if they're statistically significant, right? Or maybe right. Sorry, I should say, especially if they're statistically yeah. significant, you don't want to go run off to the hills and say, hey, check this out. Um, you want to be careful about that because you got to remember this is the whole issue of the, what is it called? The garden of forking past again. We want to be careful about that all the time, I think. And that's something that you always, 
I always have, I mean, I think I run into this all the time where I'm doing something for somebody and, you know, you're trying different things and you, you have to, I, now I low, I like stop myself and go, wait a minute. I've tried this like 10 different ways now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think, I think what it's telling you is like when you're, when you're working with clients and, and or people, it's like, I think it's really important to like be careful about what you show them. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. I make that mistake. All, I've now yeah. I'm better. Oh, hey, this is so exciting. Though. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh yeah. When I was, when I was, especially in younger days, I would do that all the time. Like come run into the, you know, <laughs> run into my advisor's office, go check this out. But he's always, he's always pretty good. Ah, go back and check it again. <laughs> yeah or well no i mean like, but it could be i'm not saying there's a mistake i'm just saying you could have made a a winner's curse yeah no that's, not, that's exactly what I'm, I'm not it's a real result it's i'm not oh right right right. it's yeah, not a, it's not arithmetic it's not a disc layer it's a thought process error right yeah he used to always accuse my, my my thesis advice used to always tell me that i i suffered from this uh jumping to early conclusions thing and he kind of cured me of that it took me it took me a while but you know, I'd, I'd be one of these guys. I would often be like, "Oh, this is probably what it is," and then I'd be like, "That's what it is. That's I'm done." You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so I had to learn not to do that. Same thing. Yeah. First thing that works is not always the answer. Generally, it's not right. So uh, I wanted to then look at this uh, example in R that he did here. So I'm going to switch screens. Mm. This is for the sample. This is for the interaction thing. I thought it was pretty cool, and we have time. Sure. Um, oh yeah, we got plenty of time. I'm going to. Switch my share to back to this, I guess. One of these things. Yeah, you can, I, I think it's easier if you just unshare and then like reshare. But oh yeah, this works actually. Never mind, Oops. it works. I don't want to close. Yeah, I don't want to open it to get ignore. Um, I'm going to. This is called. Um, what is this called? Crap! I forgot what's called. Hang on a second. Sample size. Okay. There it is. This is just this is just the tidy. This is the thing you can download the tidy Ross thing. We're just going to use it directly as it is. Uh, so it just mm -hmm. uses a tidyverse and our stand. It's going to give an error here when it can't read in the source uh, file comment because I'm not in the right directory. I'm in the wrong project or whatever. But none of these things in here matter. They're all like beautification things, so it doesn't really mm -hmm. hurt anything. So the idea for this section was to simulate um, an like an interaction problem, right? To just demonstrate how interactions are harder to estimate than the main effects. Right. So what is it? What is we're doing here? We we generate a uh, outcome variable that is a randomly distributed normal variable, right? And then these um, predictors, which have nothing to do with the outcome, right? Just keep in mind these are just these are just random predictors, um, minus a half, plus a half, minus a half, plus a half. They don't actually predict anything. Okay, this is all noise, uh, but that's okay, right? So we put this into a nice little tibble, um, and. That's basically it, right? Just make it into a table. Yeah. Where is it? There it is. Okay. Yeah. So these are just random normal variables. These are just random plus half minus a half. They're not actually associated with, there's no correlation between these at all. Yeah. I keep repeating that just for my own benefit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll tell you what this function does. I see it just allows you to change because in the- in Yeah, the I was actually wondering that too. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. So for, um, you can cat, you're concatenating um, the two V underscores. Yeah, and then sampling only one or either the first one or the second one randomly. The point of doing this is that you could just write in here, you know, my, just generate directly minus half plus half. But in this uh, exercise, we are going to be changing that minus half plus half to other things. So mm. just to show the effect of it. Um, so first is minus half plus half. So the, in the minus half plus half, the reason for that is that way the effect has the uh, uh, a value of one, right? One is the difference between uh, the two, the, the effect of that particular predictor, even though it has no effect, but at least there's a change of one, right? The delta is one. And the other thing is that the uh, average is zero. That's, that's why choosing that, right? That's like what you should normally choose. And you can do the fit on that. And again, he says, um, well, this is just fitting on one of them. I don't know. In the book, he does it, but he doesn't actually show this. So I'm not sure what's supposed to conclude from that. So I'll just get past that. Fit on both of them and an interaction, right? So you can see that uh, as you would expect, right? The, um, again, he says to ignore these because this, this is just fitting on noise. These parameters have no meaning. So they're all zero in the, in the model, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Those are all zero. But the standard deviation is what you want to look at here. And um, you can see that, yeah, they do follow the formula that um, the 
the standard deviation on the main effects is 0.6, and the the interaction effects are you know twice, uh, mm. right, as as we expected, right? Oh right, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, twice as big. So you need. I was thinking, yeah. Where's the four? The four comes back as a square root. So if we wanted to reduce that by, uh, you know, a factor of, you know, to be the same. And the, and the strength of the relationship with the predictors doesn't make any difference, or like it does. Right. What, okay. Yeah. And then the next part, he wants to say, well, what if we use a what if you use a coding that was zero one for the each one of the things, right? For each one of the the variables, mm -hmm. and just skipping that. And then in that case, you find that the uh, standard error of the interaction is unchanged, but the standard error of the main effects has increased by a factor of square root of two. And why is that? That's because when you do it this way, you're, these slopes now are for the, not for when the other predictors held at its average value, but rather when the other predictors held at zero. So you're basically using half as much data. Mm. Why? So basically the only thing that changed the standard error on these uh, individual slopes went up because they're, they're only based on half as much data. Got it. And then finally, you can get back to the, the instead of using minus half plus half, you can use minus one to one. And in that case, you would now be using all the, you'd be now fitting each one on the average value of the other one again, zero. But um, the scale is bigger. And that's all this does. Oops, let's skip that. I don't care about that. This just makes the scaling, it's just a scaling issue, right? So it's just uh, each one of them has gone up by, uh, uh, you know, the, the predictors have gone up by two. And the interactions, which involves both of them, goes up by four. And that's why these are all. Like the point of this was just to see how, you know, how the interactions are affected by these um, these scalings, right? Yeah. To understand that a little better. So when you increase, you know, these things are go by the square because they involve two things, x one times x two, essentially, right? So that's why that happens. Okay, so that was that section. Um, let's go back to where you were. So I don't know why he hammered that so hard, but I, it was useful for me because I actually was not, it, when I was looking at that section, it wasn't clear to me what would happen in like each one of those cases. So I'm glad I went right. and did that and read it. It's clear in hindsight, but ahead of time, like, huh? So, yeah, no all right. So this next section talks about uh, design calculations after the data have been collected. And what he means by that is like taking a look at what the data, what, how, I think what he means here is he takes a look at the experiment and say, okay, now, given this experiment, like what would have been the power going into it and did this experiment make any sense to do in this way type of thing, right? And he goes back to that beauty and sex uh, ratio thing from chapter nine, where if you remember the study claimed that very attractive parents were 8% plus minus 3% more likely to have girls. Uh, and he asked, you know, this is actually similar in the similar vein of the ESP type experiment. It's like, well, this doesn't make any sense. I and mean, why would you expect that? Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the study claim, uh, the, so how should we get as much credence? Well, first we kind of reiterate some things you said, maybe in chapter nine that, you, you know, Hey, unusual things do happen. This could be one of those 5% cases. Right. And also he points out that the researchers, you know, picked for their final report, a particular comparison, only the most attractive parents versus all the rest. There's other things they probably looked at as well. So there's a little bit of, you know, uh, garden forking pass here that, is involved as well. Yeah. So uh, he also points out that previous studies of similar things that never, you know, don't, well, they would suggest that seeing an effect uh, even as large as 0.5% would be a huge surprise, right? So this study, you know, going into that, this study should have made a, the sample size probably too small, right? Because if you think the effect's only half a percent, uh, this study is only able to detect an effect that's 12 times larger. So it's just set up for type M error or maybe type S, we don't know. Maybe the beautiful people have more boys, we don't know. Um, but the point is the study just is underpowered. And it's one of those cases where it's an underpowered study and they just got lucky in quotes, <laughs> right? Uh, so he makes an interesting observation at the end of this section. And that is that, hey, you know, everybody learns in statistics class or any class, uh, social study class, whatever, that when you have very large samples, there's you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna have uh, statistically significant but not important results because you just have such a huge sample size. It's like oh, I got a 0 0.25 plus or minus 0 0.005. Um, that's statistically significant, but the actual effect is of no value whatsoever, right? You're always gonna have things like that. Sometimes people report these things, and 
But you know the press gets it wrong. That's why everybody hammers this because the press always gets it wrong. It's like, oh, there was they saw a significant improvement in cholesterol. It's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> what do you mean by significant? <laughs> right. Um, so, but he said you should also remember though that only large effects will be significant with small samples. So in a small sample, you're setting yourself up for a different kind of problem where you do see both practically and statistically significant results, which are still misleading. And you should be wary about that, right? It's not saying don't do it. It's just saying, you know, you could make, be aware there's weak evidence and suggestive and not a definitive result, despite the, you know, all the, you know, the, what do you call it, traditional statistics telling you, oh, no, this is significant, you know? Yeah. That's why I think, um, I, I've never done this, but I've read this a number of times that like in census type research, you don't use p-values because the data is so large that like any little difference yeah. between groups or whatever is just going to be significant just because of, you know, the massive right. sample sizes. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it's, I guess the point would be that like just because there is a difference doesn't mean it's an important difference, right? Right. And then I just come to the last section. Uh, this is a, um, you know, this is, I love this. You know me, I love this fake data stuff. It's my favorite mm -hmm. thing. I know it's the next chapter also has some more fake data. So I'm very happy about that, but I love fake data. <laughs> I know. It's actually, it's actually like the, one of the hottest topics. I mean, like in psychology, like once again, like, you know, where we kind of are followers as opposed to leaders when it comes to a lot of stuff. Like there's a lot of articles that I've, I haven't read, but I've been seeing a lot of things yeah. like, you know, looking about like, the use of, of of simulated data as a way of you know yeah, verifying you know um, results and yeah it's becoming quite a thing now. In, Especially in, if, you, if you get some complicated statistical models going on, some complicated statistical tests, and 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 it's some, and let's face it, we're not all brilliant. I oh, know I'm not brilliant. I don't understand sometimes, but I forget what these tests are for, or like how they're derived, and does it really apply to my case? With something like this, you can you can check that, right? You can check mm -hmm. that it makes sense. Or check that it doesn't make sense. That tells you, oh, I better go back and understand this better. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he said, this is the most clearest and general way to understand a future study. Just simulate it. So I'm going to use the example. Again, this is not something I generated from the fake midterm final in Tidy Ross. I'm just going to go through it. Um, it's an example of using a randomized experiment of 100 students designed mm -hmm. to test some intervention. The intervention, it uh, doesn't matter what it is, but somehow it's maybe like extra tutoring. It's going to help. Uh, improve uh, a five, the effect size is five points. Okay, that's the anticipated effect size, five point addition to the final score. Um, the final exam score is assumed to be random with, uh, I have so many spelling errors in this thing, with a mean of 60 and a standard deviation of 20, right? So we're gonna, uh, the, the point we're gonna, what we're trying to do here is demonstrate the effectiveness of using, oh, so one of the things he demonstrates in this, what you're gonna do is look at the effectiveness of using a pretreatment predictor, as I said before. And it gives two kind of cool results. One is it reduces the error on the effect estimate because you're controlling for some of the variance. And the other important thing is it can help control for a selection bias, which he demonstrates in this example as well, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And the selection bias, just to tell you ahead of time, is the idea that this, the treatment is not applied fair equally. It's more likely, perhaps the compassionate teachers are more likely to apply it to the poor students, or not the poor, but the students who did more poorly on a midterm, right? All right, so... With that exposition and I'm done, as they say, what does they always say? That being said, my dad always said that. Said, yeah. <laughs> it's a popular, popular thing. Let me move this window over. There you go. Uh, so let's find that one. Fake data midterm. I just love these things. By the way, there's two sets in here. This first one is the for the, what they did in chapter nine. Just in case you're wondering if you go into yeah. this thing. Yeah, I, I have I've downloaded that. Yeah. So again, don't worry about that error. Uh, so let's see if we can remember. Let me see if I can remember what text going on here. How much time we got? Okay, we got time. We can walk, we can think about this a little bit. All right. So first, we're going to simulate the uh, final um, for going to be hundred students, and if they're the control group, their final exam result is going to be sixty plus minus twenty, and if they're treated, uh, they're going to be five points better. We said that before. Yep. And then we're just going to randomly sample half, you know, half are in one group, half the other group. Uh, here, we're just using FLs to do that. So that generates that first uh, simulation. No midterm is involved yet. Okay. Yeah. So having done that, you can do this the hard way. I'm just going to skip that. Uh, or you can just use, uh, you know, a linear model, which seems like overkill, but it makes things easier. So we fit this linear model and we find that the effect size is anticipated to be 
4.6, which is what we expected, but the error is four, right? So that means, um, what does that mean? Oh, he says, don't focus on the point estimate, <laughs> which I just did, because if you repeat this for another batch of 100 students, you will find, uh, you know, just another simulated thing, you will find, oh, look, in this case, it's 12. You could do it again, you get minus something or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't, shouldn't focus on the, the predicted effect size. You really want to look at this standard deviation. So this tells us what we should expect for the power for this, or the, not the power necessarily, but the, uh, the standard yeah. deviation from the, this kind of experiment. And if that's good what enough. That, what was that up above? It's 3.7 here. What's it, what's it up above? Four. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> he says there's this, you know, he points this point that, you know, this stand, this thing is in some ways can be just calculated from sigma, right? And so since sigma is pretty well uh, confirmed, right? Plus it's very small error compared to its value that this estimate is actually pretty good of the, of the error. Okay. Okay. Now, um, so that that's you know that's it. Now you, now you know that like if I did this experiment in this way, I'd expect you know that kind of error. If that's good enough, then fine. It's not going to be good enough to get a, a reliable power for getting a ninety-five percent estimate. That's for sure, right? <laughs> we need you know two. We need two and a half times that sample size, probably, right? Uh, oh, you know, well, we need to get the standard error down to be two and a half, two point eight uh, smaller than four, right, or than five, right? To, to, to be happy with that, but that's not the point here. The point here is just like, what is what is the uh, result going to be? All right. But rather than increasing the sample size, maybe we could use a pretreatment predictor instead. So what we'll do is we'll check them on the midterm, okay? Because if they do well in the midterm, they're, this will take care of some of the variance based on basically how smart the kids are, right? The smarter kids will do, is, you know, we'll separate them out, right? We'll, we'll separate them out based on their they're, uh, well, they're smart as in this class anywhere. Their ability to retain the material in this class, let me put it that way, right? Wait and a minute, so, did, did you pick the 50-20 um, the designation or was that from the book or whatever? That's from the book, yeah. I wonder why, like, why would you want to, like, why, I mean, why not make it yeah. zero and sigma? I mean, I don't, I don't, yeah, anyway. Well, be... because it's a test, right? It's 50, you know, you get a 50 on your test, you got a 50% score, right? Well, right, I know, but that's like, that's not like really, Good though, I mean, I mean, or I guess. Oh, we'll, right, that's a pretty poor score. Yeah, sure. Oh, that, yeah, it doesn't matter though. You're right. I mean, we're just simulating some. So this guy actually gonna skip this because here he just adds in this midterm and then you know adds it in, but really actually it's not a it's not a uh, not a control variable because he just simulates the two things separately, have nothing to do with each other. So I'll skip that part uh, and go to the part where we actually make a better model. And this new model, we generate some we generate some underlying latent. A true ability for the students that we obviously can't measure and he huh. divvies up the error the original 50 percent or 20 percent error into part part of it on the ability and part of it on the fluctuate so there's two kinds of fluctuations here one is just the students are spread about in different abilities and the other one and these are just made up numbers right which is what you right. do when you do fake data you just make up numbers to see risk school right and yeah. it's okay and uh then so if they're in the control group they it's their true ability plus some now it's around zero some fluctuation around zero how well they actually did on that maybe they didn't get a good night's sleep maybe they didn't study as hard as they should have whatever right there's some fluctuation there uh and then why is it plus 10 now no that's plus oh no what is this plus I'm wondering 10? about that maybe that's the oh uh, right because right so uh this is they do 10 points better on the final than they've done the midterm this is just everybody should do like 10 points better on the final they did in the midterm because they're, I guess, because they're steady. That's I don't. They didn't really give a good explanation for that, but I guess because they learned something in the meantime. Okay. And now on top of that, ten, we're getting an extra five for the for the group. control group, right? Yeah, got it. So that's all that is. So they do ten better than their ability, their their latent ability on the on the final. So we have two variables. Uh, first one is the midterm x. This is their midterm score. There's no plus ten. That's just the midterm. And then finally, we have uh, whether you're which group you're in, and then and then we then we have the mid the final score which is the two variables we define up there if it's you're in the if you did the, if you're in the treated group you get the treated if you're in the control you get the control okay so um again a simple comparison is same as just a regression on the treatment so we do that and look what happened here do you know oh, i didn't evaluate this <laughs> helps you evaluate things right and we find that the uh but why didn't the, oh, this is just, this is just ignoring. So this is just, this reproducing what we did before. But even though I made the whole model up, right? I'm just, what if I only looked at the midterm without adjusting for the pretreatment predictor, I find the same results I got before, plus or minus about 4% on the prediction. But now if we include the pretreatment, right? 
x, we find a reduction in the error. That was the claim, right? That we can, one way we can reduce the error is by doing this uh, pretreatment. And the other point of this is you can check these things and how, how much, how effective they are with, you know, you have to make some assumptions, which requires putting in some, uh, you know, your, what you know about the field and everything. And, and you know, these are just for design purposes. So you don't worry, they're, you know, you know, they're not going to be perfectly correct, but they're just to help you design an experiment. This is a perfectly valid approach, right? You're going to, I mean, obviously, what, how do I know the student's ability are, are spread around that, you know, but because I've been doing teaching for a long time and I, that's my gut feeling or whatever. It's fine enough. And, and if you do the actual experiment and these things turn out to be very bad, then you'll adjust that for your future, right? I assume. This is not from the book. That's just me talking, by the way. If anyone's watching this, think I'm talking about the BS, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now the next thing, which I thought was really cool, is this uh, adding in a selection bias. By the way, this plot won't work, I don't think. So... I'm gonna skip that. I don't think it's important for this, right? This is just demonstrating there is no selection bias in the original model, obviously, because we didn't put it in. Uh, now, if we do add in some selection bias, so how do we do that? Uh, so again, there are two abilities, the same as it was before. Uh, the same, the effectiveness of the test, the final test is the same. The difference is who gets chosen for uh, the treatment. And here he's using this, um, uh, a logistic curve, not because it's a logistic regression or anything, just because it's a convenient curve to use to uh, to to ramp from you know the poor students, the poor, students who did poor on the midterm are more likely now to get um, to get tutored or whatever the treatment is, and therefore, right, we might you know we expect it to be there's some obvious bias in the treatment then, right? So that's what this code does. Uh, I'm not going to skip this plot because it won't work because I didn't. That sequence range function is something just defining that. Well, I mean, I could just run this, I guess. That's the reason why I can't, right? And then now I can plot this, right? No, it's still doesn't know this curve function. Why didn't that work? Is that in here? I, mean, I don't know. I want to kind of see this curve. <laughs> okay, so there we go. <laughs> Forced it. <laughs> so this is that the bias curve here, and now you can see that the, the pretest score, which is shown here, this is the midterm as our score, and you can see that the students that did more. Um, poorly on the midterm are going to be more likely to be treated. That's the, the goal wow. here. And this is because our, you know, compassionate tutors, we're not using random selection. And so we can uh, run that experiment. Oh, so the point of this is to really see what's happening. You need to like, uh, what, what we're going to do is this, this captures that whole experiment again, but we're going to do it like multiple times. So you can see, uh, not you know, we can see like average of we can average over the effects right so we can see what's happening and rather than just seeing one estimate we're going to get a bunch of estimates and, and average them this actually takes a minute uh, to run okay a second or so And what we'll see though is that in the, if you, so what, what are we running here? Let's go back, take a look at this. Uh, there's two different models we're using. One is a model that doesn't take into account the midterm at all, right? Just the one that's just based on the final. And we should see some, bi we should see the, bi let's go back here, right? It's done now, but we're the, the one model we're doing is this model, right? Just Y goes like Z. Just again, trying to predict on the treatment variable uh, only what the effect of the, what the final was, okay? And due to the bias, what should we expect to see? We should expect to see that the treated students actually did worse, <laughs> right? Why? Because we're the treated students uh, the, were the ones that did poorly on the midterm. So of course, they're still going to do poorly on the final. And it looks like the treatment made it worse. That's the effect of the bias there, right? Mm. Whereas if we control for the, the pretreatment, then that goes away. And that's exactly what we find. We see that actually, if we didn't control for the, we didn't know about the bias, and we didn't control for the midterm, we would have said, well, their treatment didn't work at all. <laughs> it was horrible. Because we didn't realize that the teachers were being compassionate and only tutored those students that were doing poorly in the class. <laughs> so we selected out the poorer students for the treatment. But you can fix that by controlling for it, and then we find 
this is in fact the uh, model modeled improvement that we expected from uh, and we can see here's that's what the standard error is too. And that's what you'd want to do if you're actually doing a design like this. You wouldn't just one run. You run one run. You'd run multiple runs just to get a good, a much more solid estimate of this number right here, which one you really care about, right? Yeah. And of course, you know, and also to check this number's right, maybe there's something else weird with your modeling too. But in the end, anyway. So uh, you know, I mean, that you could detect this, but I guess you wouldn't necessarily detect that bias because you, you had to put it in by hand. But mm -hmm. anyway, that's that thing. It's kind of cool. I'm not going to say that because just yeah. Not my thing. Um, let's see. Let's go back. Do share. I don't think there's anything else. Um, yeah, I, I, I did work up some stuff on 1610 if you want me to go over that. Yeah, we've got time, so that's good. Um, we yeah. got like uh, I don't know how many minutes you have left to your thing, but we, all the time hey, you want. I have, you know, a, I, have, I have to leave a few just for a meeting. But but before we get into that though, um, so next week is so we're clear. So um, next yes. week we're in chapter 17. And yes. I'll, I will take that. And um, do you want to do any, like, you want to try any? I, there's a, I don't know if um, there are a couple uh, simulation type problems on page three, three, four. Um, if you wanted, to, I wanted to see if you'd be interested in taking Yeah. Uh, three, three, four. That's, that's the, and the print version. I don't, I don't know. That's what I'm, I'm looking at too, the print version. Yeah, I like I like print books because see here's mine. I get I just yeah. have trouble sometimes with the computer. Well, yeah, I'm trying to get away from it. I actually have been getting I'm doing more and more reading in like PDFs and EPUBs and stuff. Just yeah, me me too. But I mean, I still like having the book for something. I, I got a, I have an iPad now that I use for reading stuff yeah. and things. So and I got that O'Reilly subscription. It's like all kinds of great you know books to look at on there. Yeah, I know it's overwhelming how many good things yeah. are in there. So like you can do either like 17.2 or 17.5. 17.5, you'd actually have to like simulate like missing this. Um, I don't know if you're interested in that. Take or, a complete with data set of, of interest to you. Or 17.6. Let me do 17.2. There may okay. be other ones beyond that, but at least I'll, I'll sign up for 17.2. Um, Sounds good. And yeah, seventeen six is a follow up from seventeen five, so you kind of have to do both if you're going to go down that route. Uh, let's yeah. Else like that. So I'll, I'll may look at seven. I'll do seventeen point two for sure. In time permitting, I'll look at the other two. Sounds good. Which All right. Not, so is my <laughs> is my R session popping up here? Yes. Okay, I got good, your, good. Oh, I like your color. I need to change that. Yeah, I was actually wondering. It's funny you mentioned that because I uh, was just thinking the same thing. Like, uh, you know, you do that? I used to have the white, you know, background, but supposedly this is easier on your eyes. I don't know. I, I actually I, like, but I do like. I like your your. You know, sometimes I do like the idea of, of doing white, um, but whatever. All right. Cool. Um, okay, so this problem was. Um, it's uh, the, we're using the electric company data, which you know originally you might think, oh, that means electric stuff. No, it's electric company, the TV show, which you and I are probably Sesame Street. Yeah, only yeah. probably we're old enough to remember that. Oh I, yeah, I, I remember that. I remember what's Morgan the Freeman. Was, uh, Morgan Freeman was on Electric Company. It was it was the same company, I think, as Electric Company. Um, so we have a sample of like one through four grades, I think. And so suppose you want to perform a new experiment under similar uh, conditions, but for simplicity. Just for second graders, with the goal of having eighty percent statistically significant results at five percent, you know, ninety-five percent or five percent, whatever, in grade two. Uh, so the first thing they wanted you to do was state clearly the assumption you're making in your design calculations. Hint: you can set the numerical values for these assumptions based on the analysis of the existing electric company data, which is uh, sixty-eight. Uh, I guess they're classrooms. We have pre-post uh, test okay. scores. Um, I, I didn't not all of this stuff I oh I totally understand but um yeah anyway I, I so yeah so what are some assumptions okay so I'm using first assumption I'm making I'm using the the, the existing second grade data to uh, infer about the power and uh, sample size issues that's obvious um, I'm assuming that the sample data collected reflects the mean and variation of scores in the population I mean that's always anytime we do inferential statistics we're doing that right of some kinds um, I'm assuming that sample data collect, 
collected reflects the mean and variation of scores in the population. Um, so, so um, oh, and then uh, the electric company, I'm also assuming that the electric company intervention was strong enough to show an effect if it actually exists. I mean, you know, we, right. this is all secondhand data. Okay. So uh, I started doing all of the stuff that they were doing, like in the book with all the, you know, and I, I ran, I, I screwed it up because like I said, I, instead of using um, a standard, units of standard deviations, I use like a mean, the mean difference between the two groups at post-test. Um, so I ended up just doing kind of something a little bit more like basic, just using like a, a power okay. function. Um, okay, so first off, they're evenly divided between um, treatment and control. And so um, all I'm doing is um, just calculating the post score. So for the first thing, I'm, you know, that we want to we want to be able to simply compare the average scores for the treated uh, classrooms to the average score for the controls. So I'm just assuming that just means a post test for now. So I'm calculating what the mean is at post for treatment and control, and what that difference is, and what the standard deviation is, and you know, doing like the, the, the merged standard deviation that I need to do a, a calculation. And there's this thing called power.t.test, which is a pretty standard, like a lot of people use this in medicine and other areas to do um, t-test sort of comparisons. Okay. Uh, so you take the mean difference. And okay, so it automatically takes care of the t-test and the rest of that, or the t -test. Right, yeah, so the, the, the d is that is that sort of, um, is the standardized difference, which um, ultimately, probably, you know, I could you could probably use in 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 a lot of different things. Anyway, so we have we want eight, uh, point eight um, eighty percent power, and then you know 0 0.05 and two samples, and so basically, what it says is we would need you know almost twenty nine people or twenty nine classrooms. Excuse me, each of these rows is a classroom, not a right. Um, so we would need almost thirty classrooms in each group um, to get. Um, you know, uh, you know, sufficient power, right? So then the next thing that we got into was um, instead of looking at just like pre post or excuse me, like um, scores, we're going to look at the average gains. So like the, the gain scores for each. So I calculated this by subtracting the pre from the post, and you know, you can see here, right? So this is hopefully you can see that. Um, so now all I'm doing is instead of calculating the post test, I'm just po calculating that that gain score, right? And I'm just doing the same thing all over again. I don't know if this is correct or not. This is just what made sense to me at the time. And also I only did it like a couple hours ago. Okay. So now because we're just looking at gain scores, it's a lot more uh, expensive. Let's put right. it. Right. Yeah. So yeah, you would need 60 people in each group or 60 classrooms in each group. I don't know if that did that correctly or not, but um, do you have any thoughts about no, that? No, I, I didn't do it either, so I don't know. No, I mean, so it was those right. Eight, yeah, so, so so using, you know, uh, delta scores, you know, basically change scores instead of raw scores. I mean, I guess what we're, so that's telling us is, is it's just harder to detect that effect. Yeah. Um, so we need a bigger thing. It's funny because, like, yeah, if we were doing this, you know, just in the in the world and using real world data, we probably would do both of those things on the same data set. You know what I mean? Just right. to see, of course, what this is telling us is that it, we're powered differently, obviously, for one over the other. And then the last part was repeat, but um, now we're gonna do the pretests, which you kind of talked about the using. Yeah. So I, I didn't even get to that. I, I ran out of time, but um, yeah, I was trying to do um, all of this stuff. I was using three point one. And I was using that mean difference, but really it needs to be doesn't it needs to be like the, the units of, of standard deviations is where we got I got off. So anyway, um, but yeah, I don't know if you've ever used have you ever used this function before? No, what what library is that in? It's in um, P. Uh, it's called the PWR on PWR, Power. Okay. Yeah. Power Library. And so yeah, I mean, this uh, that's is, cool pretty it's this is like way before like the tidy verse and stuff so i mean it's like if you want to like like you know get stuff out of this you got to do a bunch of um you know specific you know kind of pulls from from the objects but uh yeah i mean i've, I've used this type of stuff you know 
in a lot of studies, you know, just using, you know, t-test, obviously, you know, not, com not controlling for a bunch of things, although that's something that a lot of people are trying to do more and more now in medicine. Yeah. But I have yet to kind of learn as much about that. So yeah, that's it. So, um, so how about this? Yeah, we'll, we'll get into chapter 17 next week. Yeah. 17 looks like another short one. So I don't know if we need to split it, but feel free if you feel it. No, 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 no. Well, I mean, well, I'll, um, yeah, it's only, well, it's only 20 pages and no, I think we're, you know, let's, just, let's try to, um, I think also what we're learning is we're not going to learn everything in a chapter. So I think, um, no, you know, trying to get through this. So yeah, basically we got 18, 19, 20, 21. Yeah. Man, so and we're in a causal infer. Yeah, I mean, I guess we, could, yeah, we don't probably need to do the appendices, but so we've got <laughs> no, we don't. We got one, two, three, four, five, six more chapters. So each of us will do three more. Yeah, and this was a beast. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, this has been an interesting experience, but I also say that like one of the things is like, I think. Um, I don't know about you, but like when he, we, we, you get these like sort of Bayesian outputs with, like, you know, with the standard, you know, the MADs and the, you know, the standard errors and stuff, it's, it's really hard to, you know, you, because there's not like this one definitive like p value moment where you're like, oh, it's significant or not, you know, it is a little bit anxiety provoking, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you're like, what does it mean? Well, you know, it depends, you know, and it's like, I think, um, yeah, no, I think this is a lesson because I think so much of our like the winner's curse or whatever is. Yeah. Just about wanting to be certain about something, you know what I mean? And there's and no certainty. <laughs> there's no certainty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it's it's just, it's a good lesson, but it's yeah. also a hard lesson because it's like, yeah, it's like he's not really teaching us how to definitively do X, Y, or Z. It's like here's a bunch of tools that you can use to um, do stuff, but know that like here are the the risks, or here are the downsides, or here are the things that you know. You know what I mean? It's like I yeah. think that's it's, it's it's interesting, but a hard lesson to um to go with. But anyway, I'm rambling. Here. No, I mean it's good thoughts because it is true. I think that um, you know, a lot of times you're like, what's the you know, kind of like when I was learning physics, a lot of people, you know, some people would approach learning physics like, oh, what's the formula for this or what's the formula for that? And that's yeah. the wrong approach because that's not that doesn't give you any deep understanding. And the same thing is true in statistics, like what 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 test do I need to use for this? Yeah, if that's the question you're asking. I feel like you know, or it is a question you should ask, but also you should maybe understand better why this particular test is useful or not, right? Well, yeah, and also like not just um, the flow chart that you know in that uh, statistical rethinking book, um, uh, whatever his name is. He has this like flow chart that he like you know he says this is like the curse of every you know statistician. Like they got this flow chart. Like uh, what kind of test is it? Do what is this? What what can have? What population do I have? And you go down amazing. this thing to figure your test. Like if that's what you. If that's your knowledge of statistics, um, then you're kind of limited yeah. uh, just to doing those things. And, you know, and then you also probably more limited than you think because a lot of problems don't you think are these following this flow chart don't really fit that. You're kind of squeezing it in there because you know how that how to do that test. Right. Yeah. Well, I, that happens all the time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's. Um... Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. I mean, this book is it's, it's, it's not about giving you tools to make simple decisions is about giving you tools to make hard choices yeah know, or, or about you know potentially to make hard choices you know i think that's and, something he says at the beginning that that's yeah, but yeah it probably does I, I didn't mean to suggest that say that. original thought but yeah it is like it is no, no, I wasn't, yeah it is sort of like a um yeah it, there's something about it that you know you, you do feel yourself sometimes feeling like okay why why can't this just be clearer you know easier because that's what that's the problem is like the, the consumers, people that consume our work, they're like, why are you so uncertain? Just tell me what I should do. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. I'm used to that. Though. I mean, I worked for, uh, you know, I worked at MIT. It was, there was a lot of times we were given, we got, I got, you know, people complaining to me all the time about giving them results like that. It's like, well, what should we do? You didn't tell me what we should do. I'm like, well, cause you have to decide <laughs> you know? You know I mean? based on these uncertainties and based on what, you know, what risk you want to take. Yeah. I can't tell you, you know? Well, anyway, man, uh, next week, I will, uh, we will yeah, see you we'll week. Move onward. So six more weeks. Or see you also probably Monday, right? But yeah. Yeah. I'm all Monday, of course. But yeah. Take care. Okay. Take you too. Bye. Bye.